Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to our already 37th web seminar of the series of this Latin American webinars on physics. My name is Nicolás Bernal and I'm from the Universidad Antonio Nariño in Bogotá, Colombia, and I will be your host today. So our speaker today is Enrico Nardi, so we're happy, super happy to, to have you, Enrico, from the ENFN Frascati in Italy. And Enrico will tell us about uh, action physics, actually his title is the window for preferred action uh, action models, right? And so I remind that you guys can be part of the discussion, writing questions and comments using the YouTube uh, live chat system um, via Twitter. So now I can hand you over to, to, to Enrico. So Okay, so Nicolas, thanks. Know. Thanks for inviting me to give this seminar. It's nice, nice experience. Hope everything will, will work properly. So just confirm to me that uh, you see the mouse and you see the slide. Yes, perfect. So that's a brief outline of my talk. I will uh, give a short review of what is called the strong city problem. Uh, just um, I will browse uh, through the various experimental searches, the ongoing and the searches that are planned for the next uh, next years. I will describe main, main types of axion models. Uh, uh, there are uh, generally denoted as uh, KSVZ or QCD or Adronic axion models. This uh, refers to some a single type, and uh, uh, Dine, Fischler, Zrednicki, Zipnitsky, the FSZ axioms. Uh, I will uh, describe uh, uh, what type of dark matter can we get out from axion through the misalignment mechanism. And then uh, I will move to the original part of the talk, which is a description of the window where experiments should look for, for axioms, so the phenomenologically preferred axiom models, and uh, for the hadronic axiom, and also I will add something for the DFSZ axiom models. Well, where should we look for, for DFSZ axiom models? So the strong CP problem, uh, QCD is defined in terms of two dimensionless parameters, not one, but two. They are not predicted by the theory. So measurements yield uh, a number which is pretty reasonable for the strength of the strong interaction. The measurement depends on the energy where it is performed, but uh, is a number of order around one unit, unity, roughly. For the second parameter, which instead gives the amount of CP violation in strong interaction, we have uh, only a, a, an upper limit, but the upper limit is so tight, 10 to the minus 10, for a parameter which uh, uh, you would also expect is order one, that uh, the situation is really uncomfortable. And we would much prefer if, for some reason, this parameter uh, is in fact zero, vanishing. So, uh, I say that uh, this parameter theta bar describes the amount of CP violation. In fact, we can write uh, two sources of CP violation in the QCD Lagrangian. One is given by complex masses for the quarks. For simplicity, I take just one copy of left and right uh, handed quarks. And one is a, a topological term, uh, theta multiplied by uh, this combination, gg tilde, with some the proper coupling, which uh, under integration in the 4 uh, is, uh, is a number, is a topological uh, invariant of the gauge field configuration. So in the action, you should read the second term as uh, n time theta. Now, Uh, these are not uh, two independent sources because uh, uh, you can uh, perform a chiral rotation on the mass term, put the mass to be real, and uh, since the transformation is anomalous and the anomaly has precisely the, the structure, modulo a factor of two, then you will have a shift of this theta in theta plus two alpha. If you kill 
we say alpha transformation this, uh, this phase. The other option is that uh, you make disappear this term by putting everything inside a complex mass. The um, relevant uh, point is that just the difference between theta and theta q is the physical quantity. So there is just one, one physical parameter that violates CP. Formally, you can obtain uh, this term uh, in a beautiful construction due to Fujikawa in 79, where you can uh, study uh, if uh, the measure of the path integral is or is not invariant under a chiral transformation, you find that it is not invariant, and when you properly regularize with a gauge invariant procedure, you get that the transformation induces precisely this term, the term that is written there. Uh, just a side remark. Now, uh, theta different from, uh, from zero implies, among other things, a non-zero neutron electron dipole moment. How, how big uh, should be this quantity? It's basically the size of the neutron, so something of the order of uh, uh, one Fermi, times uh, a, a loop factor, and times the value of theta. So it's very simple. Uh, at least uh, on the basis of dimensional analysis, you, you expect this value multiplied by theta bar. You have this limit, so 10 orders of magnitude, lower than what you would expect, which forces you to set this limit. Or well, there should be a, an absolute value, of course. Note that this problem, this is a small number problem, is qualitatively different from other problems that we have in the standard model. For example, theta bar receives the first finite log correction at order alpha square. This means that if you put by hand theta to 10 to the minus 10, it remains stable. You don't have a natural problem. You don't have a technical problem with natural laws. This is unlike uh, uh, m square h, which is quadratically sensitive to a cutoff scale, and uh, it is a very small number if you consider it uh, on the scale of, of, the Planck, uh, of the Planck scale. Unlike uh, the Yukawa couplings of the first generation, which are also small, even not as small as theta, but not, uh, certainly not of order one, uh, theta bar it evades explanation based on environmental selection. So you cannot appeal uh, to the idea that uh, why, why it's so small, otherwise the universe would look so different from what we know. And I mentioned this paper from um, Lorenzo Valdi, where uh, this argument was, uh, was explored in some depth. So you see, uh, it makes sense to study the, um, the issue about uh, strong CP violation independently of other small number problems. Solution, basically they are classified in three types of solution. One is a massless quark. This is the simplest solution. If you have one massless quark, then you have an exact chiral symmetry. So a theory with any value of theta can be made equivalent to a theory with a theta equals zero. The only candidate uh, for massless quark was uh, until maybe 10 years ago or so, the up quark. But nowadays we know that uh, M up is different from zero by more than 20 sigma. So this is no more possible solution. Another class of solution, they impose theta equals zero by imposing CP conservation. Of course, CP is violated in weak interaction, so then you need uh, to do something to generate the phase of the CK CKM matrix and also to generate other phases that uh, uh, might be responsible for the baryon asymmetry of the universe. We know that we need CP violation for the matter antimatter asymmetry. So this type of solution typically have a high degree of fine tuning and a very elaborated construction because if you allow for violation of CP in one sector of the, of the theory, in some way this will, will leak in all sector, within all sector via uh, loop corrections. And we have still to fight with this number, 10 to the minus 10. Moreover, this uh, type of uh, models don't have a single unambiguous experimental signature. 
this is not a theoretical issue, it's an issue that makes more appealing a model where you can tell what you should see to prove that the model is correct. The last class of solution rely on the so-called Pechet-Queen mechanism, where you assume a global U1 symmetry. It must be spontaneously broken. It must be QCD anomalous. If you satisfy these two requirements, this is a good symmetry to solve the, the strong CP problem. A spontaneously broken U1 implies a, 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 an ambugold stone boson, but since anomalies in an instant on the ground break explicitly the symmetry, this is not really a massless Goldston boson, but is what is called a pseudo Goldston boson. It acquires a tiny mass. This object uh, is known as the axion. Now, the axion, uh, the U1 symmetry is reflected on the axion transformation properties as a shift symmetry, is written here. Eventually, the axion will couple to everything only derivatively, as a good number of Goldston boson, but non derivatively to the uh, anomalous term, because this is the explicit breaking. Now, when you do things properly and you work out the potential for this type of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, scalar, scalar uh, boson, you find that it's uh, equipped with uh, a periodic potential, which uh, brings the axon right to the place where uh, in the background, so its vacuum expectation value must cancel exactly theta bar. In few words, this is generally say that described as uh, the theta becomes a, a dy dynamical parameter with uh, space-time dependence and is uh, driven dynamically to zero at the minimum of the potential. Axon models. So the first attempt was uh, straightforward. Uh, well, identify uh, the axon with the phase uh, of the Higgs in a two Higgs uh, doublet model. To its doublet model, because that's the only way you can enforce a, a Peche Queen symmetry. With one, one X, you cannot. However, in this case, the vacuum expectation value is uh, the electroweak value, it's written here, and this implies that uh, uh, the axon interacts too strongly with uh, matter, with standard model particles. So this solution was ruled out quickly after being proposed. You need to require that uh, the vacuum expectation value of uh, the axion field of the scalar is much larger than the electroweak web, so much larger than the 100 GV scale, something around 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 GV. That's the, the right scale. Those models are uh, altogether denoted as invisible axion models because the axion interacts so weakly, so weakly, that it's very difficult to detect it. And here we have two types, two classes of models. One is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, DSFZ axon, where the standard model quarks and the Higgs are charged under the Peche Queen symmetry. You need two Higgs doublet and one scalar singlet. This scalar singlet can get a, lar a large wave, as large as you like, without affecting the phenomenology <coughs> of the W mass and Z mass. The standard model leptons can also be charged in some model, in other models they are not. Another option is instead to leave all the standard model particle uh, chargeless under the Preche Queen and introduce new fermions charged under QCD, transforming under the, the, the SU3 color, and uh, 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 again, a scalar with a Peche Queen charge. So in this case, the complete sector of the uh, Peche Queen type of solution is, uh, uh, is made of, of new particles. Regardless of the fact that these classes uh, seem to be quite different, there are um, some crucial model independent features. One is that the axion mass is always inversely proportional to the uh, to the Peche Queen breaking scale. Uh, keep in mind, if you want this uh, simple relation, approximate relation, where M axion is equal to the pi on mass multiplied by the ratio between F pi, so this is 93 MeV, and FA, which is uh, uh, around 10 to the 10 GeV. 
and you can recast in this way. So the typical uh, mass expected for the action is uh, very small, is around milli electron volt and even less. All axon couplings also go inversely proportional to the F parameter. So it's very useful in experimental exclusion plot to betray F for the axon mass. So you can get uh, plots where you have uh, axon couplings and uh, uh, as a function of the axon mass, which are the relevant parameters for low energy phenomenology. Here is a short description of the axon landscape, so possibilities. In the first upper line, you, you have the axon mass, and below you have uh, Fa. This is a capital F, but it's the same thing, F, a normal F there. So we have exclusions from uh, axon production in the sun, from the supernova, from uh, cooling of red giants, uh, here for, from uh, uh, the CERN Action Search Telescope. And basically, below 10 to the 9, or 10 to the 8, if you want to be conservative, uh, as a value for F, or above 5 in 10 to the minus 2 electron volt for the axon mass, uh, the axon is excluded. On the small side, uh, we have uh, uh, searches from uh, ADMX. Uh, ADMX uh, is, uh, um, I will describe later, but is searching for uh, dark matter in the form of axons. And uh, uh, it, it ranges, the limit range around this uh, value, 10 to the 11 or so. Uh, a strong argument is that axons contribute to the dark matter and you cannot overclose the universe. So for natural values of the parameters, this region above 10 to the 12 is excluded. There is a still some controversy because of this it depends on, on the, how, how the um, topological susceptibility of QCD uh, goes with temperature. It's a very delicate and complicated argument. Uh, typically, what you get is between 10, uh, 5 in 10 to the 11 and few in 10 to the to the 12, depending on, on, on what is, uh, what is uh, uh, the detail of, of your simulation, typically on the lattice. So I mentioned that axion can give dark matter. In fact, they can, uh, can give dark matter in three different ways. One is uh, through thermalization. So axion can be also produced via interaction. interaction. Some amount of axion is always produced via interaction. The heavier the axon, uh, the, the, the heavier the axon, the larger its coupling, the more easily you produce a thermal component. Uh, another way is uh, from uh, decay of topological defects. Uh, axon physics is uh, plugged by uh, topological strings uh, and uh, topological domain walls, which eventually have to decay and can contribute to some axon population, but uh, the most beautiful mechanism is what is called uh, misalignment, which I will describe. So as long as uh, the temperature is below the breaking of the Pechequin symmetry and above QCD, we have uh, a spontaneously broken theory with some massless mm, goldstone bosons and a flat direction, which is uh, the minimum of this uh, potential, is represented here. The axon equation of motion uh, 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 is described here. As I said, uh, it has uh, a, a periodic term. Without a mass, uh, you see that A is constant. And the solution of this equation is for uh, a dot equal zero and A equal constant. As soon as you go down with the temperature and you approach a lambda QCD, then the potential becomes sensitive to the explicit breaking. Explicit breaking gives an explicit mass, and this term starts becoming important. Once this term dominates this one, eventually you end up in, uh, in uh, an undamped harmonic oscillator. So keep in mind that uh, at the scale of lambda QCD, the Hubble parameter is 10 to the minus 9 electron volt. So it's already very, very small. So as soon as the mass starts going up, you know, because of the QCD effect, 
you immediately fulfill uh, this equality. And a second, not a second, an instant after, this mass dominates. And because this goes down as a temperature to the second power, well, the mass goes up uh, as temperature to the eight, at least this uh, in, a, in a diluted gas, uh, instant on gas uh, computation. The potential tilts in this way, the flat direction is lifted, and, and the axion starts oscillating, assuming that it was not accidentally sitting really here in zero. Any other place in the axion was sitting, it will start rolling down and up, down and up, undamped. You can show that the energy stored in this oscillation scales with the scale factor of the universe as a, a, a to the third power. So it behaves as cold dark matter. That's the, the crucial point. Uh, it doesn't, also the axon is so, uh, so light, it doesn't scale as a, a temperature to the fourth as radiation, but as temperature to cube. Uh, I will skip this and go to search strategies and current limits. So astrophysical bounds are typically very strong and they can constrain coupling of the axion to um, the photon, to the electrons, in case uh, your model uh, allows the axon to coupling to leptons, to couple to leptons and to the nucleon. You always have this coupling. And you see that uh, this is uh, uh, the mast of the model, and the, the limit on the coupling from the supernova implies this scale. So typically people assume so between 5 and 10 to the 8, and, uh, and below 10 to the 12, as I, as I mentioned before. So laboratory search techniques, they are virtually all sensitive, at least until today, to the axion photon coupling. They are of three types. Light shining to the wall, haloscope, helioscopes, we see a bit uh, in detail. So axon typically coupled to photon, and you can imagine that you have a magnetic field, an axon coming, it converts, and a photon coming, it converts into an axon, it goes to a wall, again, it converts into a photon. So you pay uh, axon photon coupling here, axon photon coupling there, the square to get the rate, so a factor of g to the four to the fourth power. So that's um, a pictorial uh, image of, uh, you see, uh, you, you shine a laser in the magnetic field, something is going through, and some of these actions that are passing through are reconverted. Haloscopes, they uh, are looking for the action in the form of uh, dark matter. So if we have uh, actions oscillating around, with a, a magnetic field, uh, we can hope to convert the axon into the photon. So not the photon into the axon, but the axon into the photon. Uh, the typical uh, power in a cavity uh, for, um, absorbed by this conversion goes as the volume, as the square of the magnetic field, as the number of axons in the local uh, patch of the galaxy, and um, multiply by a, a, a coefficient, which is a quality factor. You need to tune the cavity to meet the resonance condition. So just to tune, you search for a specific mass of the axon at each round of your experiment. And then you tune, you, you change the volume, so you, you, you change and modify a bit the resonance condition, or you put gas, you modify the apparatus. Haloscopes, uh, the axon dark matter experiment at the University of Washington is presently the most sensitive uh, type of experiment of this, uh, of, of, of this technique. Helioscopes, axons are produced in the sun if they couple to photon and are emitted. So the, the sun is a potential uh, source of uh, a copious axon flux. You just need a, a magnetic field hoping that you can reconvert the axon into a photon. Since the typical temperature in the sun are around a uh, uh, few keV, what you get are photons in the X-ray band. Helioscope, uh, there is uh, uh, the ongoing third generation experiment is cast, ongoing at CERN. It gave very good result and uh, new results are expected for the summer. And uh, a 
project which hopefully will be founded but is still um, going into an advanced state of R&D is, uh, is YAXO. CAST is using a um, superconducting magnet that was a prototype for LHC, while uh, uh, for uh, YAXO that will be probably located in DAISY, still has to be decided, the, the magnet is, uh, is brand new. And this is uh, some uh, 20 meters object that has to follow the sun. Now I go quick here just to show you some of the new proposals. So this is uh, Princeton MIT, this is University of Western Australia, um, this is in Korea, cool task. In Korea they even mm, founded uh, an institute uh, which is uh, uh, called for Axion and Precision Physics. Mad Max, uh, Mad Max uh, is um, uh, mainly a German proposal, uh, Casper is in the United States. So this is a very nice experiment, but I have no time to describe it. Uh, this is the uh, University of Florida. Quax uh, is, um, is one of the INFM proposals in uh, Legnaro, in Italy. So you see, with so many, uh, so, 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 so many uh, proposals, <laughs> you have to tell possibly to the experimentalists where you should search for action, where you expect to see the action. Usually there was a, a window which is depicted here uh, that was uh, in some way a bit arbitrary because it was uh, centered on a, a reasonable value and uh, the, the, the width of the window was just taken from the literature, from various models in the literature plotted here. So, the uh, window from axion models was plugged in some, in some sense, but some arbitrariness in its, its proper definition. So now is uh, our contribution in the last few minutes to, to, to few, possibly. So what we decide is, okay, take the drawn in axion model, they have new quarks, and uh, they can sit these new quarks <coughs> in representation of SU2 and U1 and see if they give problems. So what type of problems they can give? I'll go quick here. Basically, they would give a problem if they are stable. We would have strongly interacting um, relics. And strongly interacting relics uh, are an issue in cosmology, a serious issue. Second, if they sit in too large a representation of SU2 or, or SU3, they can induce Landau, Landau poles in, uh, in the running of the gauge couplings, which is a, a real unpleasant feature. So we classified all the possible uh, cues that are allowed to decay into standard model particle fast enough. That there is a limited number. When you impose also uh, the condition that there will be no Landau poles in the gauge couplings below the Planck scale, you are left with 15 possibilities. So here also I have to go fast because I think I have half an hour, which is almost gone. But uh, the result uh, is, uh, okay, here I describe a bit more. Cosmological constraint, you see what happens. If the action, if the Q, the exotic Q decay before 10 to the minus two seconds, no problem. After 10 to the minus two seconds, they will start affecting Big, big Bang nucleosynthesis. Long after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, they start leaving uh, non-thermal radiation that affects recombination and leaves an imprint in CNB radiation. After recombination, if they decay, they contribute to the diffuse gamma ray backgrounds that uh, has been constrained by Fermi. If uh, Eventually, you say they have a lifetime longer than the lifetime of the universe, so they do not affect all this type of phenomenological um, events in the history of the universe. Well, in general, they uh, contribute too much to the energy density of the universe. Uh, as we say, they overclose the universe. So the limit is here, 10 to the minus two seconds. They uh, uh, are, are forbidden, not really rigorously forbidden, but let's say it would be unpleasant to have around particles that live longer than that, strongly interactive particles. Here there is a detail 
of uh, uh, the contribution uh, to the dark matter. So this is uh, log 10 omega uh, h square, omega of this heavy quark, h square. Uh, this is uh, the limit, uh, which is the dark matter uh, as measured cosmologically. You see that uh, uh, if the annihilation of the quark uh, is a free annihilation, basically they cannot be heavier than maybe 4 uh, TV. Otherwise, you enter in the overclosure region. This little corner might be well uh, excluded soon by LHC, sooner or later, maybe in the high luminosity. There are other mechanisms to annihilate the QS bound states. I will not go into it. And they give a lower limit, so the truth is in the middle, but we have reason to think, uh, motivated reason to think, that the answer, the real answer, is much closer to the free annihilation lines than to the bounded annihilation line. Yeah, there was a scheme of um, how um, annihilation via bound state could, could, could proceed. So, that's the first selection criteria. It forces us to assume that they decay through uh, operator of uh, dimension five or at the three level. Dimension six was already given to long lifetime. And then the second criterion is that uh, uh, the, the beta function uh, should not reach the the explode, uh, should not drive the coupling to explode below a scale. We take it 10 to the 18 GV just to avoid uh, comments uh, or maybe objection because uh, it's known that the uh, quantum gravity contributions tend to uh, delay the occurrence of Landau poles. No? The sign of the contribution is known. But at 10 to the 18 GV, you can expect that those contributions are still negligible. So, that's a list uh, of the model where here you have uh, of the possibilities, not model, the possibilities. Uh, so here you have uh, the representation, triplet of colors, uh, sextet of colors, uh, eight of colors, 15 of colors. Uh, this is SU2, so we have doublet, triplets, uh, doublets, uh, and then this is uh, hypercharge. Mm? So these models are phenomenologically free of the two types of problem I have described. For this type of models, you can compute the uh, axion photon photon coupling, which is parameterized in terms of, this, of these numbers. These numbers are related uh, to the anomalies, electromagnetic and color anomalies of, of these uh, heavy quarks. So you see, the possibilities are restricted. When you plot uh, uh, the possibilities, you have uh, uh, the one with the weaker coupling and the one with the stronger coupling to the photon. And you plot this on, um, on your mass axion photon coupling diagram, and you see that uh, you have a window, which is now phenomenological motivated, which has a good overlapping with what was uh, assumed before. And if you want, luckily, it, it, it drifts a bit towards larger couplings. Of course, you are also allowed to take more than one representation together. Here we take only one. If you take more representations, you have more freedom, but you cannot take as many as you want. Because more representation, you hit the Landau pole condition at some point. So we have computed the maximum allowed value of the axion photon coupling, allowing as many representations you like, subject to the condition that you have no Landau pool. We get a larger number, which is here. This describes, I say, the axion photon coupling. And uh, uh, the window is here. With uh, two representations, you can even also have, uh, if you want, unfortunately, complete axion photon decoupling, at least within experimental errors. So now you have to think that all this band should be considered as a, a phenomenologically allowed band. If you insist of only one type of quarks, you are fixed in this uh, stripe. If you allow for two or three types of quarks, then all this corner from here to there is where your axion model can sit. I go quick to the conclusion. Uh, of course, one say, well, what about these DFS-Z axions? Well, 
for generic models which are natural, which are reasonable, you can show that you fall always within the same band. So this band eventually describes all natural axon models uh, that you can think of. Um, there are possibilities to get uh, larger axon photon couplings uh, for this type of, uh, of models through a mechanism which uh, is um, a recent uh, invention which is uh, called the clockwork mechanism but um, which means uh, that you besides the the scalars that couple to uh, to fermions you introduce a, 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 a large amount of other singlets that do not couple to directly to fermions just to boost up the the Peche queen charges okay i will not go in detail because uh, honestly i don't like uh, very much but uh, you can add the scalar doubles up to 50 without uh, violating uh, the, the condition of Landau poles. So with 50 scalar doubles and each step, each scalar connects to another, to another, to another, to another, you can enhance exponentially the charges and get uh, to factor of this uh, ratio that describes the action to photon coupling as large as two to the n. So this is what is called a geomet geometrical, it's called exponential, but in fact is a geometrical enhancing of the coupling. So I reach the conclusions now. The axion hypothesis provides a well-motivated scenario beyond the standard model. It's by far uh, the preferred type of solution of a problem which is a real, is a real problem, a real serious problem. Axion models solve the, the strontropy problem they provide an excellent other metal candidate, although they have not been invented for that. This was a consequence that was discovered later. And uh, the nice feature is uh, that uh, uh, there is an ambiguous test, which is just detect the axon. No? Detect the axon, measure his coupling to the, to the photon. And then once you do that, you, you are confident that the Strong-CP problem is uh, solved via a Peche-Queen symmetry mechanism, a Peche -Queen mechanism. Theoretical developments are still ongoing, so uh, there are some uncertainty that will be hopefully reduced uh, with further studies on the lattice. A theoretical uncertainty due to model building also should be reduced. And the final point is, where does the Peche queen symmetry come from? It is a global symmetry, but it's not even a symmetry because it is anomalous. So uh, there is no reason why it should be respected uh, by gravity, not only gravity, and by other physics beyond, uh, beyond the physics of the standard model and of axiom. I have uh, to mention that uh, we are concluding a paper right with uh, Lorenzo and Luca Di Luzio, uh, where I think we have uh, an interesting proposal on how to generate accidentally a Peche Queen symmetry and how to protect the symmetry to basically any desired work. So that uh, would, be, would be, I guess, a relevant contribution to, uh, uh, to, fix, uh, to fix this unpleasant point uh, in, uh, in in axial physics, the origin of the Peche Queen symmetry. There is a healthy and lively experimental program. Experiments are entering now the preferred axion window for the QCD and uh, for the, the FSZ axions. So still, uh, uh, these windows have been only scratched a bit. In the next years, the intense experimental program will explore large portion of this window. New, new ideas are put, put forth. For example, Casper, I mentioned before, is an interesting experiment because it wants to measure the axon coupling to nucleons, not to photons. So even in our region of parameter space where the axon decouples from photon, Casper will be able to get a signal. Quarks, quarks is measuring uh, the axon coupling to electrons. So again, we have uh, an experiment that uh, is sensitive to axon couplings, even if the axon is decoupled from the photon. 
So until, until today, all the experiments are only sensitive to the axion photon couplings. It's very welcome that we have proposals that um, tend to, to, to go beyond this. So I conclude here, uh, resuming what uh, is uh, the original contribution of this seminar and what we have done is uh, uh, defining uh, an axion for a window for preferred axion models on the basis of precise phenomenological requirements. And I, I thank you for your attention and here I come. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, I can. So, thank you, Enrico, for this super interesting seminar. And now we should pass to the question round. So, please uh, let me remember you, guys, that you can ask questions to Enrico via the Google's Q&A system at the webinar webpage, and also via Twitter using the hashtag uh, LAWOP. So, oops. so I don't know if you guys have some questions from the audience. Yeah, yes, I have a question for, for Enrico. So, uh, Enrico, first of all, very nice your talk. And I wanted to ask you, uh, in this Peche queen mechanism, is it possible also to couple to leptons exclusively this action, right? Yes. It is. It's mainly, you can't, I mean, in the sense, it's only possible because there is this QCD anomaly that perturbate the, the, the potential, I mean. No, the, the, the question is, can be this mechanism be applied in the lepton sector exclusively? Or? No, 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 you need the QCD anomaly. That's the point, you need a QCD anomaly because uh, uh, you have to cancel a topological term which has the same structure than, uh, than the anomaly. That, uh, that's the trick, you know? The trick mm -hmm. is, uh, to have a QCD anomaly and uh, the axion couples to the QCD anomaly, to the GG dual, no? to the gluon gluon dual uh, term. But uh, in, uh, in Dine, Fischer, uh, Zrednicki, and Zitniski models, um, the, the Higgs carry a Peche Queen charge. Now, you have the option to decide that the Higgs uh, doublet that couples to leptons is not the same than the Higgs doublets that couple to the up and down quarks. In that case, uh, it is not needed to give the uh, queen charges to the leptons, and the leptons are a separate sector. But if you want to, to follow a more economical uh, type of models, where, uh, for example, the down type Higgs uh, doublet couples gives masses also to the leptons, then since the down type Higgs uh, Doublet carries per chain charges. Also, the leptons have to check, uh, carry per chain charges. Uh, in that case, it is unavoidable that uh, the axon, which is composed by the uh, orbital modes uh, of all the scalars, mm -hmm. will eventually couple to, 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 to leptons. So, in that type of models, uh, having couples to the electrons is, I would say, a natural expectation. Not, uh, not a mandatory expectation, but a natural one. You cannot uh, build up a model that uh, is axion coupling only to the leptons because uh, in that case uh, you, don't solve, uh, you don't solve the stronger QCD problem. But you can write models of that type. In that case, uh, you, you call axion-like particle. So it's not an axion. The mass uh, of the pseudo nambugol composon doesn't come from the QCD anomaly is typically put by hand uh, as, a, as an additional term uh, and you get a coupling only to the leptons. These are axon-like particles that, uh, are, uh, in my opinion, are less motivated than, than the, than the uh, QCD axon. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, a little bit continuing with this question, also with the, what you mentioned in the, in the conclusion about this experiment, look in the the interaction with leptons and, and quarks. Uh, what is more or less the, the scales of these couplings with these fermions? In the sense, because for the gamma 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 action, it's more it's a value that is more or less motivated by if you want to couple dark matter or stuff like this. But 
the natural escape for these other couplings should be more more or less the same order of these uh, couplings well, to photons? All the couplings uh, um, are um, given in, uh, uh, in units of GV minus one. Mm -hmm. This is because uh, they are uh, uh, non renormalizable couplings. And uh, um, the scale is fixed by the inverse of the symmetry breaking value. So one over f. As I tried to, to explain, uh, um, f should be rather large, larger than, than 5 in 10 to the 8 GV, and uh, uh, not too large, because if it is too large, uh, you would produce too much dark matter in, in the form of uh, axions from the misalignment mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it's believed that it should be below 10 to the 12 GV. So that's the window between, let's say, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 GV. <coughs> and all the coupling <coughs> go inversely with F measure. Mm -hmm. So you see in this, uh, if I can uh, switch on again the presentations. Uh, you see, the range here is uh, typically from 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 11, GV minus 1. Is uh, depending on the axial mass. So uh, that's why it has been called uh, the visible axiom, because uh, the larger the scale, the more easily you can hide it. Mm -hmm. so here, here you go towards large scale in this corner. And um, that's, uh, that's part of the difficulty uh, to explore the parameter space at small masses, and which means also small couplings. Here, at large masses and large coupling, we are already doing a good job. You know, here, cast and, uh, and Yaxo um, in the future will we, we'll just cut uh, some slice. Here is working uh, ADMX. With the resonant cavity type of experiments. Okay, this uh, is also a bit model dependent because uh, it assumes uh, that all the local amount of dark matter is made up uh, of, uh, of axons. Mm -hmm. So, under this assumption, they get these limits. But if axons are only a, a partial contribution, the limits uh, would change. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, We'll leave time to other questions, I guess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rico. Yeah, so are, are there more questions? I think I saw okay, a question I can see up one here. From... Yeah. OK, please go ahead, Lorenzo. No, no, I said that I saw one appearing. I also would have a question, but there was already one by Paola, I think. Is that the one okay. you're talking about? Yes, yes. So Paola Arias is asking you, uh, Rico, uh, in these new action bands, how should be the dark matter window be understood? And uh, how yeah. can we find the new yeah. parts in the near future? So, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not depicted here. You see now, you see the diagram. Can you see the diagram in uh, yes, the yes, screen? Yes. 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 So, the region of uh, uh, where action could be a good cold dark matter candidate is uh, around uh, here. Let's say I could tell you between a uh, few in 10 to the minus six, uh, up maybe to um, five, eight, and 10 to the minus four. That's, that's a, a good uh, window. If you go uh, to um, larger mass, and that is also to larger capping, you see this line. Here you hit uh, uh, a limit where the axon interact uh, sufficiently strong that they get thermalized. So in that case, axon could be hot dark matter. But uh, uh, in some way, uh, this um, will be sooner or later. This part here would be will be excluded. I, I think. In any case, that that's nothing to do with the um, misalignment mechanism. So the, the, the window is around the axial masses of uh, 10 to the minus um, 5, uh, 10 to the minus 4, and few in 10 to the minus 6, or few in 10 to the minus 4 around here. If you go to lower masses, 
Then, uh, under some uh, condition, which I can mention, and maybe if you want, I can explain, um, the action would uh, be too abundant, and they will uh, overclose the universe. The reason is the following. If you, the axion starts oscillating with an amplitude which is uh, um, typically of order f. Hmm? So the energy stored as, uh, is proportional to some power of f. If f is too big, of course you get too much contribution. So f big is in this corner. Now, there are possibilities to evade that. One possibility is uh, uh, no, there is basically one possibility, which is imagine that uh, accidentally the axion uh, starts oscillating very close to its minimum. So you fine tune the initial condition. You say the, uh, the, 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 the axion field was not distant, something of order f from the minimum, but in fact it was very, very close uh, uh, to, the, to the minimum by some, some accident. Now, this works only if the Pecheckwin symmetry is broken before inflation. Because if it is broken before inflation, then a small patch, which a single value of f, gets inflated. And uh, uh, all, uh, all the universe, or the visible universe, will have uh, basically one single value of the web f of the axiom. So that's a new parameter. In that case, this is really a parameter you have you have to measure. You cannot play this uh, fine tuning of initial condition game in, uh, in post inflationary scenarios where the action, uh, where the, the Pechequin symmetry is broken after inflation and, uh, and is not restored during reheating. Because in that case, uh, uh, different patches of our visible universe and they have uh, the size of. Uh, um, Few, few parsecs, uh, because uh, the relevant scale is the, the scale of uh, 100 MeV, the QCD scale, where the axons start uh, uh, oscillating around its value. So, in that case, uh, to get uh, the amount of their matter is, uh, is correct uh, to make an average over uh, an angular variable, and the average uh, gives uh, a value which is uh, 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 square root of pi divided by 3. So the typical uh, value of the amplitude of axon oscillation is f square root of pi divided by 3, which is a, num a number of order 1. Mm? Uh, or, or pi, no, pi divided square root of 3, which is a, still a number of order 1. Yes. So, in, so in that case, uh, no. In post-inflationary scenarios, uh, the limit uh, 10 to the 12 uh, GV is strict. If you go to larger scales, the um, axions, Action dark matter from the misalignment mechanism would overclose the universe. So that can be safely ruled out. It's a basically model independent way of ruling out those values under those conditions. Okay. Okay. Yes. So Polaria has a second question. So she's wondering uh, suppose you have a discovery of an action like particle in an experiment that exploits. Exploit the copy to photons and I heat into the region. Suppose you have. Suppose you have. Okay. Suppose you have a discovery of an action-like particle in any experiment that exploits the copy to photons. Yes. And heats into the region of these new action bands. Yes. So, what information could you get from the new heavy quarks? Well. Um, you see, the the new heavy quarks are. Uh, uh, heavy, but they don't have uh, uh, bare masses. The requirement for everything to work is that the new quarks uh, get their masses from uh, uh, the wave of the axion field. So what you get uh, uh, when you measure presumably an axion coupling and an axion mass, if you discover the axion, you will have a measurement of those two quantities. Then uh, this would give you a value of uh, the vacuum expectation value of, uh, of the wave that breaks the Pechequin symmetry. So a value for f, for f. 
the masses of these heavy quarks are uh, proportional to F modulo a Yukawa coupling, which is unknown. So under the reasonable assumption, reasonable, I say, also we see that <laughs> masses of the electron up and down are, are in a way of the order of the electroweak wave. But with the theoretical preconcept that the dimensionless uh, coupling should be of order one, you would get an information on the, on the mass scale of the heavy cube. So this is what, uh, what you can get uh, as a, an information. Uh, in another way, you will measure uh, also the uh, value of F from the mass and directly the coupling. The proportional, the term of proportionality between uh, the axial photon coupling and one over F is given by uh, the ratio of the electromagnetic and QCD anomalies, which in turn depend on specific, specific representations. So uh, I would say that another information you can get from that measurement is uh, uh, what type of representation for the IVQ are ruled out and what types are, are allowed. If you have a very, very precise uh, measurement, you would uh, even be able to, to pin down in which uh, representation of the standard model group uh, these uh, heavy vector like Q-quark are sitting. And this would be, would be of course, a, a great, a great success. Just getting to that point. Okay. So are there more questions? Lorenzo, maybe? And you have found how to unmute the microphone. Yeah, I saw other questions, so that's why I was waiting. Uh, yes, uh, a quick question. So if I look at the plot that you're showing right now, Enrico, on the, oh. it's interesting, actually, this is uh, at least the second time that I kind of hear this story. I mean, not in your specific model, but in general, that it is easy to, you know, to build models that go in the, you know, lower right corner of your plot but yeah. it's incredibly hard to go the other direction, which would be <laughs> the most interesting because it's where the experiments, you know, could go. Do, do you have an intuitive reason why also in your model, like when you take this uh, number of representations larger than one, can, can you explain intuitively why it's so easy to move all the way to cover the whole lower right corner of the plot? Yes. So, uh, first of all, um, it's not one model. It's the classification of... Um, all right. possible models that satisfy some phenomenological requirements. So, uh, look, uh, just let me get this precision. Look at these uh, combo shaped lines here. Right. So, one of these lines, and there are more here that we did the not plot, each one of these lines is a model. So, this gives you an idea of the model density in this uh, density of models within, within the band, this band. Now, if you go in this direction, no, what uh, uh, there is a, a simple, let me call it theorem, a simple theorem that tells you that if all the representation have a Peche Queen charge of the same sign, the, um, uh, the maximum value is the one, the strongest coupling is the one you obtain with only a single representation. So that's a simple theorem. You say, uh, if uh, all the Peche Queen uh, charges of the heavy quarks uh, are of the same sign, this is the upper bound. You can add as many more as you want, you cannot go. But you have the option to put some with one sign positive and some with uh, another sign which is negative. So why this option uh, works? Uh, well, it works because, uh, um, you see, if I have here a different sign, uh, I can make this denominator very, very small. This is some type of effective coupling. So very small, it means this becomes big. Why you cannot uh, go as uh, much as you like to large couplings? Well, because uh, uh, this is a discrete set of numbers and you cannot get a, a sufficiently good cancellation. And you cannot add 
more than three representation. We, we have proved that uh, with more than three representation of the one that we have classified, you typically hit uh, a Landau pole. So you violate one of the uh, conditions. No, you, you cannot add uh, 25 representation of uh, uh, strong interacting uh, quarks because uh, you hit uh, immediately Landau poles in the hypercharge in SU2, in the color. No? So that, that's the reason why uh, with this, uh, within this approach, you cannot, uh, you cannot go more than that in that direction. If you don't care about Landau poles, if you say that's uh, not something that uh, I am scared about, then uh, you can add many representation and you can, uh, you can go in that direction. But we think that uh, um, we are not saying we classify all the models which are viable. We are more modest. We say uh, the preferable phenomenologically preferable axial models. So models that uh, are, are viable without uh, making uh, assumptions, no? Assumption like the axis, the, the Landau pole will take care about themselves. About uh, uh, the decoupling, so the other region, that's uh, simply an accident, no? We, uh, we get uh, that this combination or representation, so you have a, a triplet of color, a triplet of SU2 with hypercharge minus one third, and also you have a, a sextet of color, singlet of SU3, uh, of SU2 with hypercharge minus one third. If you compute E over N for this combination, you get 23 divided 12. Hmm? If you compute 23 divided 12, you get 1.92. Now you see that G a gamma gamma is E divided and C minus 1.92 with an error which is four. So within this error, these two representations give a complete and exact cancellation. And this coupling is, uh, is uh, consistent with zero. We have found a three different uh, uh, combination of representation that within this error, are compatible with complete decoupling. One gives 1.92, 1.94, another one, and 1.95, another one. Note that uh, there is no fine tuning. So once you choose the representation, E over N is fixed. It's not that you are cancelling by a fine tuning. You can question if. Uh, uh, it is a, a kind of immoral <laughs> to decide that you choose uh, uh, precisely these two types of quarks. And I would say, yes, uh, it's immoral, but not fine-tuned. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, the relevant point. It's not an adjustment. These are given by the anomalies, which are fixed by the representation. Yeah, very interesting. And you get this already. Okay. With, uh, with two quarks, two representation. If you have uh, three and so on, you get more cases, of course. Right. And, and uh, this also, we proved that you can have the similar situation also in uh, the FSZ models. There are also there examples where you can get, uh, without functioning, just with the choice of representation, you can get uh, within experimental error. No, it's not experimental. This is a theoretical next to leading order chiral perturbation theory computation. So it's not precisely, it's not exactly an experimental error. But within this error, let's say, you get complete axial photon decoupling. And this remark is just to support the efforts of experiments that try to measure axial nuclear coupling or axon electron coupling. Because if by accident we sit on top of one of those unlucky models, we will never detect the axon photon uh, conversion. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there more questions for the audience? Okay, there's one from Diego Restrepo. Oh, Diego. It's concerning these Yes, say hi about the smash. <laughs> hi, Diego <laughs> from Enrico. 
uh, concerning the smash model. So his question is concer um, okay, concerning the question about the lepton sector. In yes. these smash models, the scale of Peche Queen is defined with the scale, is identified with the scale of the CISO. A coupling between the Peche Queen what scalar what and the Trinos is allowed. You uh, being could you please comment on that? I don't know, which is a marshmallow. Smash. No. <laughs> so Smash. Repeat, repeat the quest, please. <laughs> so he said, concerning the question about the lepton sector, yes. in the Smash model, oops, wait. Ah, the, the Smash model of Ringwald. Exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. The scale of the Peche Queen is identified with the scale of the CISO, such that the coupling between the Peche Queen scalar and neutrinos is allowed. So, could you please comment on that, this, this question? Mm, and I, no, I've not, I, I, not much to say. I'm not the expert of that construction, but I wouldn't think there is a, a nothing strange, you know? You couple, the scale seems to be a, a good scale because uh, 10 to the 10 is good for the CISO and is good for, um, for the axiom. And uh, the, um, the page queen breaking scalar uh, can well couple to, to the electrons, like neutrinos. So yeah, I believe that the construction is, uh, is fine. It's fine, of course, um, trying to do one thing, uh, two things uh, with only one ingredient, it's always, I would say, a good strategy. Yeah. Because you can, you can test or constrain the model from uh, different uh, approaches. But uh, well, we, didn't, we didn't go in any detail of that specific model. So my, my answer is only a partial one, just Common sense. Okay. Thanks, Enrico. So, are there more questions for the audience? So, I guess that's not okay. There's no more questions. So, uh, let me thank Enrico and all our viewers for this super interesting seminar. Guys, that uh, in next week, so it will be April the 5th, we'll have. Um, uh, who we have? Manuela Becky. Manuela Becky, yes, sorry, talking about AMS, AMS experiments. So we hope to have you guys uh, next week uh, as well. So thank you very much, Enrico. And thanks uh, to all of you for, uh, for your attention and for following the seminar. Okay? okay thanks a lot. Bye. Have a nice day. Ciao.